Well, I mean, it's been it's been many years now, uh, almost seven years now. So, um, I'm not ashamed of it, but I absolutely regret it. I regret um, all the time I wasted, um, how I jeopardized all my relationships with my friends. And I think what I thought I was getting out of it at the time, like this, maybe perhaps this uh, freedom to create art or music, or whatever. I think that was a uh, that was an illusion that could have I could have uh, could have done that without the use of that drug. Um, so I'm not ashamed, but I, I do regret it, and I think it's it's it will always end up being a uh, a destroying force in anybody's life, and there's just no way around it. So. But there are so many risks involved from the get-go. Number one being you might die, and that actually happens to so many people. There's uh, and there's another category of people that have done it and were able to just do it enough and enjoy the experience and just move on from it. And then there's obviously the person that becomes the act. So you have to look at those three possibilities and say which one do I think I'll, how do I think I'll end up? And for me, I should have definitely been number three and died a heroin addict, but. Um, you know, I got lucky and I had a lot of, you know, not to get cosmic or whatever, but I had a lot of people that cared about me. And when I decided that I had to find a way out, everyone was there to back me up. And a lot of people don't have that option. You know, you decide you want to get off drugs and you're surrounded by other drug addicts. And that is really a struggle. Well, I would say, which drug are you talking about, first of all? <laughs> that would be the first thing. And take, taking heroin, especially, an opiate drug, gives you the illusion that, like, oh, all of a sudden I'm creative. But really, for me, what I think it is, it just it frees your mind from anxiety and worry. So it opens up this part of your brain that's usually kind of stifled because maybe you do worry or you have so much anxiety. And I think that's probably how it is for anybody. Um, but then it turns around on you where it's not freeing you up. It, it consumes and occupies all of your mind, including probably the creative part of your mind. So you're not really creating anything at all, you're just kind of getting by. So I would say it can help you create more powerful music, but other things could too. Um, sh you know, jogging for two hours, I'm sure you would get an endorphin rush from that, that you would, I, that, that's actually happened to me since I started exercising. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people don't, won't believe that, but I do exercise, and when I do get that endorphin thing going, I, sometimes I'll sit down at the piano and something just magically presents itself, and it's not, I mean, it must be there anyway, and then it's my mind's freed up to think of that thing. So I have to answer honestly, yes, it, it can help you create more powerful, more powerful music, but there are other things that would do it too that aren't as destructive and can't kill you, so. Yeah, yeah, I gained a lot of weight. Yeah, there's no way around that. Yeah, I mean, it, to, to to try to deny that or whatever, you know, it would just be uh, I would look like a, such a jackass. But uh, I think, uh, in, in my defense, I'm I'm more of a heavy set type person anyway. You're not even deciding to eat or not. It's just you don't give a shit. Up. You don't care about food. You, know? you do care about it enough to where every three days you've got to eat something or you're just gonna die. But um, beyond that, there's no. Uh, how do I answer that? There's, yeah, there's no discipline involved. You just don't care about it. All you want is your drugs and your cigarettes, and you don't even care if you have electricity. You know, much less food. Although I quit that drug, I also couldn't control my drinking and eating. So, and that happens to a lot of people. And then you just, you know, uh, you balloon up for a lack. Of, you know, not to make fun of it. I was, yeah. was making a note like <laughs> there you go. Well, it was 250 pounds and. Um, let's see, what else? And, uh, you know, November of 2001, I was missing, you know, this tooth here, and then a year later, I weighed 40 more pounds, and the tooth was over here was missing, and what the hell are we gonna do about that? And, you know, of course, Wayne's like, ah, I'll make a good story. People don't care anyway, so. You know, I crept the boards in junior high, won some uh, acting awards in seventh and eighth grade, or sixth and seventh grade, and I was actually really good at it. And I thought, you know, I guess I was kind of brash. I thought, sure, I can do this. So when I watch the movie now, um, it, it's kind of hard for me to watch because, as bad as some of the other acting might be, <laughs> I and I'm not, I'm not looking for a compliment. I think some of the the worst elements of the movie are just like having to watch me like slog through some of these scenes where it's like I'm overweight and the dialogue is read so half-assed, you know. And then you're sitting there with Adam Goldberg, who's this really, really incredible actor, you know. And you've got to act with him, so that's kind of frustrating. Um, when I watch it now, I 
you know, I, I feel like as an actor, and that, that sounds hokey just saying that, but as an actor in the film, I thought I did kind of let the director wane down by, you know, I didn't, uh, you know, I put all this weight on, I, I just kind of walked through some of the scenes. I you know, Goldberg got to the scene that day and Wayne had uh, written out the dialogue for him. It was like, you know, solid two pages of a lot of wordy dialogue stuff. And I think Adam read through it literally three times and had it all memorized. And if you watch that scene, I've got, what, four lines inter interspersed with all his dialogue and I couldn't rem memorize those four lines. And, and Goldberg's such a smart ass. He's like, hey, Drost, it's called Commitment to Craft, pal, and walked off. And yeah, yeah. Well, we Bernard Herrmann, all the all the classic Stravinsky. Uh, Bernard Herrmann did. Uh, he's most probably most famous for Psycho. For he's probably most famous for Psycho. He also did um, Taxi Driver. Was his la his last thing was Taxi Driver. Bernard Herrmann, uh, Stravinsky, of course. It's more synthesizer music. Now I can't fucking think of anything. You know, Eno, all those sort of soundscapey kind of things. Uh, well, the main the main theme actually, we started doing, doing that in the parking lot experiments in 1996, and that actually came about. We were sitting at Wayne's house, and we were talking about. And I'd done this a couple of times, but we took a piece of paper, turned it upside down, and made some staff staff lines on it, and then just wrote dots on the staves. And then you turn it back upside down and give it rhythmical values, and then it's like just this melody that you didn't make up. Na, 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 na. Yeah, made up literally from total abstract nothing. And that's where that melody came from. Blah, 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 blah.